Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I think most of you probably know me, but in case you don't, my name is Matt Jordan. I have the distinct honor and privilege of serving as the Jack, Joseph, and Morton Mandel Dean and Chair for the Humanities here at Cuyahoga Community College. Really excited to have all of you here with us. Uh, as you know, there are three main pillars of the Mandel Scholars Academy here at Tri-C. Humanities education, community engagements, and of course, leadership development. And this afternoon's activity is uh, very much in that, that last uh, third of those, uh, leadership development. This is our first My Path to Leadership presentation of this academic year. And we're very, very excited to have a relatively new and very esteemed guest with us today. Uh, I am going to let uh, Mandel scholar Larissa Maruski introduce him. But first, let me introduce to you Larissa. Uh, Larissa Maruski is a native of Brazil. She is a second year Mandel Scholar, a member of Phi Theta Kappa, the Tri-C Foundation Board's Jerry Sue Thornton Scholar, the president of Tri-C's Western Campus Student Government, and the president of Tri-C's Joint Student Council. Let me ask you for a round of applause for Larissa Maruski. <laughs> Larissa, please take it away. Thank you so much for the warming introduction. Uh, my name is Larissa and I am super excited to be here and that's such an honor being here representing um, all my colleagues. <laughs> um, so uh, I will start off with an introduction. So our special guest today holds a degree from Iona College Brooklyn Law School and St. John Fisher College. He began his career as an attorney representing various educational institutions and social justice organizations. Before pursuing a second career in academics, both as a professor of legal studies and business and as a student affairs administrator. He has served as associate provost at LaGuardia Community College, president of Rockland Community College, and is co-chair of Jobs for the Futures Policy Leadership Trust, as well as a member of executive board of the American Association of Community College Board of Directors a nationally recognized thought leader on the role of community college in shaping student success. He has served, he has served since July of 22 as the fifth president of Cuyahoga Community College, and it is my pleasure and honor to introduce you to Dr. Michael Batson. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. What an extraordinary, you. what an extraordinary background. Um, I would like to start off uh, asking you to share a little bit about your childhood and how it influenced you to become who you are today. How did you end up in here? Awesome. Well, first, let me thank you for inviting me to be with you today. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity for me because often I spend my time talking about you, talking about our students and their hopes and their dreams and their aspirations. Just before coming here, I met with a group of, of foundation members who are thinking with me about how we can best support you in your educational journey. How can we help make the journey easier, better, more vibrant for you? Because we know that you are not the future, but the now of our hopes and dreams and aspirations. I grew up in Jamaica, Queens. Uh, I grew up in a time where, you know, very significant challenges and plagues were happening in my community. At a time when the uh, crack epidemic was a big uh, thing in my community, the rise of HIV and AIDS was a big part of my community and had tremendous detrimental impact on so many of the folks that I knew and grew up with. But I was able, because of the support of the community that I lived in, uh, to continue to press ahead, focusing on my education, believing that if I became better educated, I could make a meaningful, significant contribution to my community. So when I went to law school after graduating college, I worked with the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, the Center for Constitutional Rights, the legal services in our community, always trying to help the citizens walk in and own their citizenship. 
fighting landlords who uh, allowed uh, the housing uh, places where my folks live to be deteriorated, fighting against those who did not allow many of the people in the, our community in the, at that time in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn, going through a very challenging time and, and folks not having access to the quality of life that they deserve. And so when I became a lawyer and I started to really work with different clients, I started also teaching. And I fell in love with teaching paralegal students, preparing the next generation of what I call social engineers. That whether you decided to be a lawyer or a lobbyist or a politician or whatever you wanted to be in that field, I wanted my students to understand that they had a responsibility, not just to themselves, but to the communities that they serve. Now being president of this college, as I have before this one, another college, I've had the opportunity to work with many students to help them find their path, to help them find their purpose, to help them live their American dream. That's what motivated me to join this family, and now I'm proud to lead it. And I'm really proud to be with you all today. We are really happy to have you here. Um, you, you mentioned the word challenge. Uh, I would like to know what was the biggest challenge of your life and how you uh, overcame this challenge? I guess one of the biggest challenges that I faced in my life is low expectations. There are a lot of folks that didn't have a lot of expectation that I would really do anything more or go anything further in my life. Uh, you know, in various parts of my career, people often told me that they didn't expect much out of me. I had a high school teacher that told me that I was lazy and would never amount to much, uh, that I should look for a vocational job. And while there's nothing wrong with that, telling a young person that they don't have the ability to rise, what that did for me was became the fuel to move forward. I was in a law experience when I was an attorney representing uh, a, a young lady. I came into the courtroom. I came to the desk where the attorneys are to sign in. And the bailiff said to me, I need to get behind that gate because this is only where the attorneys sign in. Not realizing that that's exactly what I was supposed to do. Of course, I had some choice words with the judge about what happened to me and still was professional. You will face obstacles in your life. You will face times when people don't believe that you are who you know yourself to be. And the greatest challenge is not to believe them, but to believe that voice in your heart that says you can make it. And I think about even being here before you today. I never thought that, I never allowed to enter into my mind this idea that I was not good enough to do whatever it is I set out to do. And that is something that I take with me as I work with and for you. I never want you to believe any narrative that others say about you that is contrary to the understanding of who you are about yourself. If you believe that you can achieve great things, never let anyone else's estimation of your ability be the lens by which you view yourself. Great, thank you. Uh, as you're talking about, one of attribute, attributes of a true leader is to uh, persist through difficult times. How do you recommend um, us as a students uh, after a particular change or stressful day? How do you best move on from these situations? What are some techniques that you, you would recommend to us? I think every one of us is going to have a bad day or two or five or ten. <laughs> but the question is, are we getting ourselves so by the day 
that we can't begin to plan the day after this. For me, when I have a challenging day, I like to find things that are going to bring me joy. So I will watch a movie or I'll play a little video game on my phone about words. I like the word games on the phone. Uh, but find ways to step out of the midst of the hard time so that you can allow yourself a little mindless time, that you can kind of woosa, if you will, just kind of get yourself together. Don't let the moments that are difficult be the defining moment. You are really defined by the next set of moments. And so we, I think deeply about sort of putting on something on TV that may be mindless or, you know, enjoying some sort of uh, conversation with my wife or, you know, loved ones or doing something that takes me out of the immediacy of the issue. Not that the issue goes away, but that in those moments I can reclaim and get myself so that I don't become less than who I am in responding to the next day's challenges. Great. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your leadership style. Uh, how would you describe your leadership style and what advice can you give to help students like us uh, to develop our own leadership styles? For me, leaders must be authentic. You have to be true to yourself. Don't be a politician. You can be an elected official, but don't be a politician. There's a difference. A politician tells everybody what they want to hear and then talks about everybody they told to somebody else that they're going to talk about. Don't be a politician. Don't be one that just wants to get along, you know, that I have to tell everybody what they want to hear so that they... I tell people hard truths. I don't tell them in a way that seeks to tear them down, but I believe that being honest, open, upfront, and transparent is better than having a syrupy smile and a great conversation, and then you're a hypocrite. Leaders do things, these three things, I think. Leaders set expectations. If you're going to be a leader, you ought to be able to speak to the things that are important to you. Leaders manage expectations. So if you can't do the things that you said that you were going to do, let people know. Don't wait and others have to now deal with the backlash or the fact that you didn't own the fact that things changed. And thirdly, leaders, in my opinion, where possible, exceed expectations. So don't just do the minimum in life. Go beyond if you can. Great leaders set expectations, manage expectations, and where possible, exceed expectations. Awesome. What, what is your biggest expectation for Tri-C? When you look uh, into the future, what do you, where do you see Tri-C in five years? Five years from now, Tri-C will be even more embedded in the economic landscape of this community. And when I say that, Tri-C will have even deeper relationships with business and industry where they will be actually swooning to get our students and that they will start to provide more financial support so that the students who come here will have better learn and earn opportunities. That you're not just getting an education, but you're learning how to do the thing that they need you to do and they're going to effectively and adequately compensate you. So I believe that that is a place where Tri-C will be stronger in the next five years. That our graduates, where they go, what they do, what they contribute, will be more understood, known, and recognized. So that when you walk out the door, and you're not just at your four-year institution, but wherever you go beyond that, that we're able to talk about your innovation, your creativity, your ability to be a world changer, and that will be tracked to some of the experiences, breakthrough experiences, that you had at Tri-C. I think Tri-C will be even more influential in how we address the critical issues of this community. So we will, for those fragile, those who are having economic challenges in this community, we will be that pathway for them to see multiple generations move forward 
because they got a great education, they got plugged in, they became great citizens, and they actually lifted Cleveland. They lifted Cuyahoga County. They lifted Northeast Ohio. That's what I want to be said about Tri-C in very clear, distinct ways. Great. Um, today we are here uh, to get to know a you a little better. Um, so uh, we were wondering, how uh, were you uh, during your college career? Were you uh, part, <laughs> <laughs> part of clubs and organizations? Uh, did you hold any positions? How was uh, Michael back then? I have to tell you now, I've been in student government since I was in elementary school. I was that kid. I had one of those little crossing guard, I don't know if they have it anymore, but back in the day, we had these little crossing guard things so that students, the students that were selected, they got to walk the other students across the street and when you time, so I had a little badge since I was in elementary school. Uh, when I got to college, I got on the Student Government Association, I ran for a number of years our Council of Multicultural Leaders. Uh, I was a part of a lot of organizations on campus. When I got to law school, I was the president of the Student Bar Association for two terms, uh, two years, what at that time was unheard of, because um, I started early on always getting involved in opportunities to lead. And part of it is an internal desire to sort of be a voice for others. Part of it is that people always said, hey, why don't you do it? And you know, I was willing to step up and, 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 and show up and be, hopefully, I believe, effective. So all of my life, I've been, since I had that little, I think if you go to my father's house, he still has my little badge <laughs> from when I was a fifth grader <laughs> of walking students across. So I've always been active and involved in student organizations. Great. Uh, and um, I would like to know, do you have a particular time, um, time of the day where you separate just to think. I'm gonna just think about my projects, about um, what is going on, and do you have this time in your life? <laughs> That's okay, I'll take that as a no. <laughs> I think, here's when I get a chance, I do, well, this is kind of like very personal, but I'll share it anyway. We're all friends, right? <laughs> I do my best thinking in the shower. I do my best thinking in the shower. I spend, because that little time, you know, I spend enough time to make sure I'm completely clean. And that gives me enough time to think about all the different projects and the things that I got going on and, and so on and so forth. And quite frankly, there's another time where I do my best thinking. It's when I get a haircut. The reason why I love going to the barbershop and also to hear what's going on, because that's how I find out everything. <laughs> but the reason why I love the barbershop is because that's one of the few times in my life where I'm completely the focus. That the work that that person is doing to get my hairline right, to make sure I can hold on three strands of my hair, all that. That I am completely the focus, that somebody's focused on the period of time that my hair is getting cut, on me and making me look better, making me feel better. They may be talking, they may not be talking. I could go either way on that. <laughs> but this idea that I'm the focus, because in my life, I'm the, f everybody else, for so many parts of my life, everybody else is my focus. My wife's my focus, my kids my focus, my students my focus, my staff my focus. Everybody else is my focus for more hours of my life than I am. So when I get to the barbershop, that is my, that's my awesome time to say, all right, now the focus is me and making me a better me. Great. And what do you do for fun? What is uh, your um, perfect Sunday? What's your Ooh, perfect weekend? After, after sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> I like to sleep too. <laughs> but, uh, you know, my wife and I, we, we like to go to movies. We like to, we haven't seen three movies in the last two weeks. We saw Black Adam. We saw Woman King, and we saw Till. Uh, so we've seen three movies, and, and we're waiting on Wakanda coming out this week or something like that. We want to see Wakanda. And different things. So we do like to go to the movies. We like to go to restaurants. We like to 
She shops. I like to watch her shop. Because I, although I look like a little shopper. I'm a polo guy, so I like to go to polo stores. Um, so that's really what we do for fun. We vacation. I like to cruise. I go on my cruises. Now, I'm going to tell you. I get on the board. I go on my cruises. And we have, uh, my wife and I have a, a place we go, Aruba. So every year we go to Aruba. And Aruba is a wonderful place, beautiful beaches, great food, wind blowing, everything's lovely. So when I'm here and I'm having a bad day, that's the other place I go. I close my eyes and I go to Aruba. <laughs> I can feel it. I can smell it. I can see it. Uh, and then I come back to America. <laughs> Good. Um, do you like sports? Do you play any sports or watch any? <laughs> Since I've been in Cleveland, I've been a real sports fan. I mean, I, I went to a Guardians game. Yeah. I just went to the Browns on, on Halloween where we won. I was there. I was there. I think it's me. I was your good luck charm. Uh, <laughs> so I do like, I do, I love the energy here and of the sports teams. And I mean, if you're on a Sunday and you're not wearing brown and orange, something wrong with you, I guess, around here. Just like everybody's so sports oriented. So I've enjoyed that very much. And I've been able, I haven't been to a Cavs game yet. So that's on my list of things I want to do. But I do like the sports here in this city. Great. Um, uh, we will have a Q&A section very soon. Sure. And um, before I hand off to our students, uh, I would like to ask you, uh, what kind of person are you in the morning? Do you like coffee or tea? <laughs> I like a donut. No, I'm just kidding. Could <laughs> be. But no, I'm not. A, I, I drink tea from time to time. I'm not a coffee person at all. Um, and I have these little breakfast bars I have. These little, uh, y'all know what the little breakfast bars. I have a little breakfast bar. I try to keep me, keep me going. <laughs> Uh, great. And if, if you can just uh, give a piece of advice um, here, how the students are uh, developing their leadership, uh, and we would like to hear a comfortable word, a comfortable word uh, coming from you. Uh, what is uh, something that comes to your mind, too? Um. If people are going to trust you, if people are going to look to you, if people are going to be able to believe in you, they have to understand and get to know the authentic you. If you are going to have one set of conversations for one folk and another set of conversations for another pe people, when those two people meet each other in the, in the, in the cafeteria, <laughs> they're going to call you out on being a phony. You may not like everything I say or do. I may not like everything you say or do. But you'll know when I say it is coming from a place of care and concern and consideration. So I would encourage leaders to be your authentic self and show up and be the same person wherever you are. Now, you're going to communicate with different people different ways. You were hanging out with your friends. You're not going to talk the way you're in a business meeting. I get that. That doesn't mean you change who you are because you change the way you communicate in different settings. Leaders, those who are true leaders, you can depend on them because what they say they mean, and they mean what they say. Thank you so much. Now I would like to open um, to the audience. Does anyone have any questions for our leader? And don't be shy because you're all <laughs> leaders. I have one right here. There we go. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you. OK. Um, my name is Maps. Um, I go to the Eastern Campus. Um, firstly, I'd like to say thank you for coming down and taking the time out to be here. And um, I was listening to everything that you're saying. And um, you spoke a lot about like what you're going to, like what Tri-C is going to do for the community. But um, given. Uh, your position, have you thought about maybe opening up uh, mentorship programs to like young leaders where you yourself are taking up uh, those meetings and mentoring um, not just like this campus but 
you know, the people of the community. I think that is very important. I mean, we have a lot of different mentorship programs, not only in the college, but in the community. One of the things that I see in this community as I come to it is that everything is not always knowable. Everything is not always aligned. If you look at, for example, 100 Black Men of Cleveland, you know, a great organization. Does everybody know about them and can have access to them? There's Big Brothers and Big Sisters. There's the YMCA. There's all these different mentoring programs in all these different places, but do people know how to access them? Can people get that support for their own professional development, their leadership? Can, can people, you know, some, if you know about it, but my concern is that we don't know about all the resources that are here in Cleveland and how to actually access them. Because even if you're aware, doesn't mean you get access. I think what I can be helpful in, as I meet different people is to make sure that folks know what we offer and to share with our community what others offer. I think that our college in these next several years will really be focused on aligning much closer with the resources in the community. I think we have a lot to offer, but we also have a lot to learn. And that this is the other thing, leaders. Never think that you're the only person that know everything. Leaders get tripped up because sometimes we think that we are the holder of every good idea and we know everything. There are other organizations that do certain things better than what we do. And we got to partner with them so that we can benefit from their knowledge, benefit from this. If I wanted to start as an example of a black male initiative, why wouldn't I call 100 black men of Cleveland versus trying to just start something internally? You know, I think we got to learn how to look at how we partner better with folks who are experts in these areas so that now we're not duplicating efforts, but that we are allowing the sort of culmination. How do we grow opportunities? How do we expand capacity? And I think that's something that I'm very interested in this college. How do we expand capacity? Because one person can't do it all. Thank you. Uh, come on, I know no shy. She's not a shy group. Hi, my name is Alma. I'm my second year at Tri-C. And as you know, um, a majority of students at Tri-C are workers part-time yes. and truly full-time as well, while being a full-time student or part-time. So personally speaking, I know that can be a lot to yeah. have on your plate, you know, being part of the community and being an employee and being a student. So what advice would you give to those who want to be a leader but want to also just try to find that balance and not over giving yourself to everyone but still taking care of yourself emotionally, mentally, and all of that? Love it. Remember that if you're a student leader, you're a student before you're a leader. Your leadership is your ability to evidence and showcase to others that they too can make it. So I think that Leadership sometimes is thought of as a title. And if, if the quest is a title, then you're not necessarily going to be everything you're meant to be as a leader. So you don't have to have a title to be a leader, but you also have to structure your contributions in ways that make sense with the totality of what you got going on in your life. Here's what I would like to do with our business and industry people. People say, well, you know, how can your students, so many of them are working, how can they work for us too, and so on and so on. I say, listen, if you come to my students and you offer them a better job than the people they're working for now, and you're going to help pay their tuition or pay to give them opportunities, guess what? They will leave the job they're at to get a better job. So what I'm challenging business and industry leaders is to say, don't just tell me you need workers. I will give you access to the resumes of our students on campus, but you got to offer them more than what they're making doing all the work that they're doing, and you got to allow them to get their degree. So you can't just say that they can only work and not go to school because that's why they're part-time in school and part-time at work. So I want to challenge business and industry leaders. You want to hire great people? Take care of them. My students are great people. How are you going to take care of them? Don't be shy. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Folks are thinking. Sure. Um, I have the 
pleasure, along with my colleagues here at the Mandel Center, of interviewing prospective new Mandel scholars. Excellent. And one of the questions that we ask them is, who is a leader that inspires you and why? So I wonder if you could answer that question as well. Inspires or inspired? Oh, either. Okay. Let me go with a leader that inspired. Her title wasn't president. Her title wasn't uh, sort of executive director. She wasn't a senator. She wasn't a congressman. She was not over any major corporation. But she had powerful characteristics as a leader. She listened. She gave loving nudges. She offered insights just in time. She questioned me in ways that allowed me to lift my head above sort of a lot of the noise that was around me. She taught me the value of respecting your peers and showing them paths which I have incorporated in my life. And her favorite title was mother. And that's my mother. She was the leader in my life, and she wasn't the president of any big corporation. But she was the president of our home. She was the person that allowed us to have dreams, hopes, aspirations, and support to do it. And so I can say, for me, she was my chief inspiration. When I was a little child, and I said to my mother, I want to be president of the United States, she didn't say, you can't be no president. She said, you have to go to high school. You got to go to college. Most presidents are lawyers. You got to go to law school. But if you do that and you help people, you can get there. Guess what? Not the president of the United States, but I got a pretty good presidency right now. And I did go to high school, and I did go to college, and I did go to law school, and I did try to do things that were in the best interest of the public. So there's a lot of people that we can look to great people of history. My mother is the greatest person in my history that has continued to inspire me. She's passed away, but she's still living inside of me in those lessons as well. Awesome. Do you have any other questions? I will ask you one more question yes, then. Go for it. Go for it. Uh, what support do you need from us as students to be transformative here and succeeding in our job? What can we do for you? Several things. <laughs> Number one, with your classmates, simply ask them little things. How are you doing? What's your goal? What's your plan? What are you doing to, to get engaged and get involved? Some of our students drop out because they feel like they don't belong here. They feel like they don't have anybody that they can connect to. And nobody bothers to ask them about them. If I had students like you who are leaders who could just say to somebody you don't know that doesn't look like you, that may not come from your neighborhood, how are you? If, if you know, I want every student to have what I call pronoia. You know, paranoia is the sneaky suspicion that everybody's out to get you, right? I'd like our students to have pronoia, the sneaky suspicion that everybody's here trying to help you. That everywhere you go, somebody asks you how you're doing and wants to see you succeed. And, and that cumulative effect can keep some students here who drop out before they drop out. If you're having a hard time in class, if you haven't met a friend, you'll drop out before you drop out. You all can be ambassadors for me in helping students stay and connecting them to resources or people who can help. You can do that for me. That will keep more people here. I will absolutely do. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> um, do we have any more questions from our audience? Yes, in the back. There we go. Hi, my name is Iman. I'm from the Metro Canvas. Yeah. Uh, well, it's two questions, actually. Okay. 
One of them, what keeps you compassion when you have those days when you feel everything is falling down, nothing is working? What makes you compassion about moving forward in your future and your life? And the second part, sometimes we go in this experience where we have to be working in a group or working in a school projects, and you would be the leader uh, or the manager for this kind of uh, group project. Uh, how would you uh, work to deal with the different personalities in the teamwork, especially when you face uh, those kind of personalities that reject everything where you're saying, especially when you're a manager, and they just want to be doing the easiest way to get the, um, uh, the project done. So how would you deal with this as being a leader? Excellent. Both very hard questions. Thank you. <laughs> how do you continue to be compassionate when people are pushing and pulling you and, and you're tired. How can you be compassionate when you're tired? And there is a such thing as a compassion fatigue because some people can, you know, I, I used to have friends that, you know, always going through, always going through, every time they're always going through. I said, man, you're going to go through the floor. You're always going through. <laughs> so you can't allow somebody else's problem to become your problem such that now you're focusing in more on it than they are. You know, I think you, we all have to set appropriate boundaries. And we all have to come to a place where there's some, some rivers you can't cross with other people. You just, like, you can be as helpful and as hopeful as you can. But you can never want for someone that which they don't want for themselves. You can't want their success more than they do. Because then it's taxing and causes you to get off track. You're going to have people that you work with in a small group that they're just not going to carry their weight. They're going to be cantankerous. They're going to have what I call DNA, a dirty, nasty attitude. <laughs> You're going to face that. It's going to happen. I don't care. I hope it's not you. Turn to somebody <laughs> next to you and say, I hope it's not you. I hope it's not you. I hope, I hope it's not you. No, no DNA all over here, right? No dirty, nasty attitudes here. What you can't do is simply allow it to continue without being checked. Now, there are subtle ways to check a person, and there are more direct ways to check a person. If I'm in a group, and we are talking about the, the duties, and we set out assignments, and one person is not doing their part, everybody's not going to report on what they did to draw them to the fact that we all did something, what you do. That is a subtle way to call out this lack of participation. And then the more direct way is to say, look, if my grade is dependent on your participation, I'm talking to my professor because I'm not messing up because of you. There are times when you have to be direct because if you are not, you will harm yourself trying to be nice. Sometimes niceness will kick you where you don't want to be kicked. Be open, be honest, be transparent, be upfront. Start with the more sort of subtle ways and then escalate over time, but don't let it go so far that it goes too far. There we go. All right, it's absolute joy to meet you today. Um, and I'm honored to be able to ask you this question that I think is kind of long. <laughs> <laughs> going, I've broken it down so much, just in case it doesn't hit you the first time. Maybe it will the second or third. OK. So you mentioned that. Um, you have an idea of what five years from now should look like. So with that in mind, of your advice on what that would look like, um, five years from now, how will businesses know how to correctly find and balance the correct diversity and variation of the many unique careers that are being pursued and earned? Um, secondly, the inverse of this question could also be reflected upon as saying, what 
Uh, and I'm asking what your advice is. What is your advice on how we as students, if the businesses don't understand what to do, as far as meeting the many unique variations that students want to pursue as far as a career, if those businesses don't know, and I'm speaking generally here, um, then what is your advice as students how we can help the businesses that surround Cleveland to meet the needs of the many careers that students achieve here at Tribe C? In other words, leave no student behind mm -hmm. without a future to lead into and develop their leadership. Love it. There's the part A of the question requires us to co-design educational experiences for students. So that as we look at our curriculum, and we don't just have advisory boards just to say we have advisory boards, we ask business and industry, what are the specific experiences students have to have in this program of study that makes them viable and people that you want to hire post this experience? So I think you will see us really think deeply about the academic programs, and how it better aligns with business and industry. I think that's number one. But the B part of your question really goes into what I believe is the secret sauce of the future for young people. Entrepreneurship. I firmly believe that the reason why a lot of young people are driving Uber Eats and DoorDash and and doing all the things that they're doing is because they don't necessarily want to work for somebody. That they may want to work for themselves and may not exactly know what it is they want to work for themselves, but they know they need a side hustle so that they can get focused on what way they want to contribute. With young people, this is what I find out, that many are value-oriented but outcome, value-driven, but outcome-oriented. So we have a lot of young people fighting for climate change and fighting all this kind of stuff. They, wanna, they really want to make a difference in the world. That's, that value's driven. At the same time, that many of them have had an uh, iPad since they were two. So they used to on-demand. We do this, we want to do this, do, 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 do. So, you want to deal with climate change, but you want to be done by tomorrow. <laughs> you don't want to be told how to deal with climate change, but you want to be told, you don't want to be told what to think, but how you might accomplish your end. So I believe because this is the mix of a lot of our students today, whether you're a millennial, whether you're Gen Z, because this is a lot of the mix of the student today, Entrepreneurship is going to be what's most important because ultimately business and industry will have to align with those who are creating the future. You all have to create the future. That's why you don't have to go to a big record company to get a record deal. You can get iTunes. That's why you don't have to go to a big book publishing co publisher and you can go on Amazon. That's why you don't have to worry about trying to get on ABC, NBC, CBS. Even people don't even watch them channels anymore. No you go on YouTube, set up your channel. Because in America today, you have a chance to do what you think is going to advance you and captivate people. Unlike ages past, where there were these gatekeepers, you all are the ones that continue to tear down the gates. You all are the ones that will drive the future, whether structured organizations and institutions want you to or not. The trick is to get you all to understand how important civic engagement is, because bucking the system, shifting the system, you're going to own it, since you should at least have some understanding of how it's going to operate. Was that helpful? <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Great. And now I would like to hand off back to your Lee Jordan. 
Uh, well, I just want to say thank you to both Dr. Bastin and Ms. Maruski. Would you, everyone please join me in giving them both a round of applause. You're fantastic. And this will conclude this part of uh, this afternoon's event, but we hope that you all stick around. We have some uh, snacks and drinks here, a chance to, uh, to shake Dr. Baston's hand and uh, introduce yourself. And so please uh, stay around for a while and enjoy the afternoon. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. Woo-woo.